In 1757, Siraj Odola, the ruler of Bengal, was defeated at the Battle of Plassey. In fact, the battle was lost before it had even begun. The commander-in-chief of Siraj Odola's army had already sold out to Robert Clive. The shadow of such treachery and betrayal haunts Bengal to this day. British traders were attracted to Bengal from the beginning of the 17th century onwards because Bengal's fine cotton muslins were highly prized in the markets of the West. By the middle of the 18th century, the British East India Company saw no alternative to military action to protect their trading interests. The defeat of Siraj Udullah in 1757 marked a turning point in Anglo-Indian relations. A century later, the British controlled most of the Indian subcontinent. The prolific Bengali textile industry was crushed. Bengal was turned into a marketplace for British-produced textiles and a source of raw materials for the Industrial Revolution in Britain. Besides cotton, there was jute. By the beginning of this century, East Bengal was producing most of the world's jute. Sacks and ropes made from jute were used all over the world. Under British rule, jute processing factories were set up, but only in West Bengal, especially around Calcutta. East Bengal, with hardly any industry, remained an agricultural backwater. By the time the British left, East Bengal, or for that matter Bengal, had become an importing country rather than an exporting country. And agriculture was poor. And East Bengal itself uh, was uh, cut off from Calcutta. Calcutta was the headquarters. And so, and the landlords used to live in Calcutta. So East Bengal was the hinterland. And in this hinterland, the majority of the population were Muslims, whereas West Bengal was predominantly Hindu. Most of the landlords throughout Bengal were Hindus and owned nearly three quarters of the land in East Bengal. There was hardly a Muslim middle class at all. 
As the independence movement gathered momentum, there arose a demand for a separate homeland for Muslims. This movement was led mainly by non-Bengali Muslims, but found great support in East Bengal, a crucial factor in the creation of Pakistan, which in 1947 united East Bengal into one country with the Muslim majority areas of Western India 1,000 miles away. The overwhelming majority of the Muslims here were Muslim peasantry, and they saw the establishment of Pakistan as economic emancipation for themselves, the establishment of democracy, which would enable them as the majority to achieve political and economic justice, freedom from the exploitation of landlord, landlordism. When Pakistan was created, most of the Hindu landlords in East Pakistan fled to Calcutta. The land passed into the hands of Bengali Muslims, but real power eluded their grasp. Some economic and industrial development followed as jute mills were finally built in the world's foremost jute producing region. But the owners were all non-Bengali. This meant that precious foreign exchange earned through the sale of jute was invested in West Pakistan, where central government was based, rather than in East Pakistan. In fact, East Pakistanis soon came to realize that they were being ruled by a West Pakistani bureaucracy and army. And this manifested itself in a very gross way in denying Bengali the status of a state language. Pakist Bengalis were 56% of the population of Pakistan, and yet the central leadership and the central government sought to impose Urdu as the only state language of, of Pakistan. Mr. Jinnah, Urdu ke Pakistan ne rastavasha kore, eta ke chapi dawa jere chesta kore chilen. Tar mool udesho chilo. Je Bengali jodi alada jati shottha niye, eta alada rastre rupantori to hoy. Taole ei region ne, shudhu Pakistan er modde noy. Bengali shobai ke dominate korbe. Ote jate kore ei jati shottha ar vikas na korte pare. Shei udesho ta chilo, phasa rupor akraman kore Bengali ke chapi dawa ya bondomiya dawa. And they manipulated the economic system such that the resources got transferred from East Pakistan to West Pakistan through trade, international trade, and also the resources received through aid uh, were mostly invested in West Pakistan. This led to a estimated transfer of about 70% of total public expenditures on revenue and development account being located within West Pakistan, found concrete expression in growing disparities in per capita incomes with visible evidence in the imbalances and availabilities of public services such as health, electricity, road transport. By the end of the 60s, the, most of the industries were in the hands of West Pakistanis. And not only industries, banks, insurance companies, the whole financial system was in the hands of the West Pakistanis, facilitated and promoted by the bureaucracy and the military regime that was uh, ruling the country at that time. So you had military rule which effectively continued from 58 to 69. And it was really those 10 years that the systematic denial of the rights of the Bengalis fueled Bengali nationalism. Because what was an assault on the language in 52 progressively became a denial of the legitimate rights of the Bengalis to participation in national government. If there was a parliament, they would have had majority of Bengalis would be there. Ashole, 
পূর্ব পাকিস্তান ছাত্রলিক যেটা ছিলেন সে ছাত্রলিক বুঝতে পারে যে তাদেরকে আর স্বাধীন রাষ্ট্র হিসাবে আত্মপ্রতিষ্ঠা ছাড়া পাকিস্তান রাষ্ট্রের মধ্যে তাদের পক্ষে বাঁচা সম্ভব নয় তাই বাষট্টি সালে ছাত্রলীগের মধ্যে গোপনে স্বাধীন বাংলা প্রতিষ্ঠার জন্য একটা নিউক্লিয়াস গড়ে ওঠে শেখ মুজিব রহমান had by 1964 become the leader of the East Pakistani party, the Awami League. One of its main functions was to express the dissatisfaction that East Pakistanis by now felt about their underrepresentation in the political and economic life of Pakistan. And you know, all of central government administration is in West Pakistan. Capital, central administration, military installations, everything West Pakistan. Though East Pakistan, a 56% population, is still they are not getting uh, any right in the central administration, economic field, and other things. Naturally, East Pakistan people want that they should get this self-determination and this full regional autonomy. Only for defense, foreign affairs, and currency should be in the hands of central government, or the refugee power should go to the regions. Now, when the leaders from Pakistan got together, Sheikh Mujib made the point, and that is the origins of the six-point demand, that, yes, we want democracy, but we also want regional autonomy. We want democracy, but we want it within a federal framework where there will be a substantial measure of regional autonomy. And six points was really the detailing out of a new federal scheme. Mujib's political campaigns landed him in prison on numerous occasions. এই ছয় দেবা মূলত ছিল স্বায়ত্তশাসনের দাবি অটোনমি যাকে বলে ছাত্র যুব সমাজ এবং নিউক্লিয়াসের পক্ষে দাবি ছিল স্লোগান ছিল যে ছয় দপা না হয় এক দপা যদি স্বায়ত্তশাসন না হয় তাহলে স্বাধীনতা ডিসস্যাটিসফ্যাকশন উইথ দ্য মিলিটারি রেজিম ওয়াজ নট কনফাইন টু ইস্ট পাকিস্তান By 1969, as Field Marshal Ayub Khan was celebrating his so-called decade of development, there were massive public protests. The scale of the uprising in both East and Western wings was such that he had little alternative but to stand down. Ayub would not hand over power to the people. He handed over power to the head of the military, Yahya Khan. Yahya Khan, therefore, who was the real source of the strength of that particular power structure now had to come out into the open. But having had to take power in the face of a strong and roused populace, he had to concede to important popular demands. One of those was for a national election. And for the Bengalis, a very important point that had been injected was one man, one vote. When Yahya Khan took over in 1969, he inherited a very complex situation. It was a long political legacy in which many mistakes had been made. And from that angle, one can say Yahya Khan was as much a victim of history as he was a maker of it. When he took this particular decision of granting one man, one vote, this was to accommodate East Pakistan's wishes, particularly Awami Leagues. In 1970, November 12th, there was a terrible cyclone accompanied by tidal waves in which uh, we lost about more than a million people. And we found that uh, there was no response from Pakistan. I mean, Western Wing, no assistance came from them. And we were very bitter and dejected about the whole thing. And I became more furious as an individual. And my troops in EPR at that time, they were also very furious. We realized that the Pakistanis really hate us from the core of their heart. And that realization took a definite shape now. We said we can't live with them any longer. So this election was conceded. One man, one vote for, Beng for, for, for all of Pakistan was conceded, but it was to have particular significance for Bengalis because their majority, which had been negated, nullified, contained, would now first have an opportunity to assert itself for the first time in 24 years. The whole election then became a referendum on six points, and we took it to the people in those terms, that this is a referendum on the future of shape of Pakistan. So far, we have been ruled from Islamabad, from Karachi. Now we want the substance of power to be in Dhaka. 
In East Pakistan, Awami League won 167 seats out of 169, whereas in the West, People's Party won 87 seats out of 138. No other party was in even double figures. Now, as a result, this election brought two important candidates in the field, Mujib in the East and Bhutto in the West. Nirbhatanul Poro, Awami League of Pakistan, Awam Sheikh Mujib. একটা রাষ্ট্র পাকিস্তানকে রাখার জন্য ইয়াহিয়ার সাথে এবং ভুট্টোর সাথে নেগোসিয়েশন করার চেষ্টা করে কিন্তু ছাত্র সমাজ এবং সমস্ত বাঙালিরা যুব সমাজ এবং স্বাধীন বাংলা নিউক্লিয়াস এর বিরুদ্ধে যাতে করে কোনো কিছুতেই ভুট্টোর সাথে ইয়াহিয়ার সাথে শেখ মুজিবের এক রাষ্ট্র পাকিস্তান রাখার জন্য এই পরিকল্পনা কার্যকরী না হয় তার বিরুদ্ধে সমস্ত কাজ করে যেতে থাকে পাকিস্তান মিলিটারি জনতা was conspiring and finding excuses how not to hand over power. So Bhutto started issuing threats and making statements that uh, there cannot be a government formed without his consent, although he was not the majority. If a constitution on the basis of his six points would have been made, it would have been almost impossible to, to function as a one single unit, as each federating unit had the power to raise its own army, had the power to conduct foreign economic relations of its own, and the center was also not given the power to levy taxes. Now, with such a loose arrangement, it's almost impossible for any country to function. And I do not think any country in the world does function under these arrangements. Uh, Mr. Bhutto, making a statement soon after the election that majority is not everything. Should not be forgotten that the bastions of power lie in the Western wing. This created a very negative reaction and there was a strong re reply from here saying that we believe in democracy and in democracy people's power is the only significant power when expressed through elections. Yaya's intention had been that after the elections there should be a period between the the elections and the meeting of the National Assembly. And that period should be utilized by the political leaders to arrive at a consensus on the broad outline of the Constitution so that it could be framed within the stipulated period of 120 days. With that object in mind, he urged political leaders to have a dialogue amongst themselves. And in that process, Bhutto also went to, to Dhaka, had a three-day meeting with uh, Mujib, but that was a people said that we have agreed on five and a half points and only half a point is, is still left. So an ultimatum was issued. You must call the assembly or else. An assembly session was called for the 3rd of March. We got ready with our preparations for the assembly. We were going to table a constitution based on six points. Suddenly there was an announcement from Radio Pakistan that the National Assembly session, which was to be held on 3rd, had been postponed. Now, this infuriated the whole country. If People's Party, which had 87 members from West Pakistan, had not gone to the National Assembly, other parties, too, from the West would have followed suit, at least some. That would have almost turned National Assembly into an East Pakistan Assembly. And that was a situation the Constitution could have been made but it would have been without a quorum. It would not have had the legal sanctity which a constitution needs to have behind it. And on that basis, Yahya thought it wise to postpone the National Assembly session. But where he did make a serious error in judgment was that he did not give a fresh date at the time he announced the National Assembly session. Within minutes of the announcement, people had started to pour out into the streets. In the stadium, there was a cricket match going on with, I think, MCC. The entire test match spectators poured out of the stadium onto the streets, saying this is unacceptable, and this was seen, as I said, an attempt to negate the electoral verdict. Immediately, they announced mass meeting in uh, university campus. Thousands of uh, general public participated, and the flag was hoisted by Mr. A.S.M. Abdul Rab. By evening in 2nd March, uh, uh, virtually the whole uh, Bangladesh people were flying Bangladeshi flag 
in every houses. Then the student leaders met with the Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Uh, there was a strong pressure from the leaders not to succumb to the Pakistani pressure and declare independence officially. I want that uh, I want to live like a free citizen of a free country. You mean independence? That I don't mean. Yeah. It can be done many ways. Go, 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 go! Sheikh Mujibur Rahman issued a statement that uh, there will be demonstrations throughout the country till 6th, which will be followed by a mass rally in Sora Dutan. At that time, it was known as the race course on March 7. Saturday March. Pothom kintu pata kete ami Sheikh Mujib ke Paltor majane diye chila. Kintu she din chokar ami Sheikh Mujib ke ei shadin malar pata kete ta ke dei. Tokon she jibba kewete thori. Tini amake bolen eita onik beshi advance. This is too early. Ami bolle silam jeita early noy. This is the correct time. Eita shorty shoma. Military movements were continuing. We had reports that military movements were continuing from the west to east. Arm supplies, we heard, were also being stepped up. So that, the, uh, and on the other hand, the popular movement was also at its peak. The non-cooperation movement continued with full vigor. From 3rd March onwards, Awami League established almost a parallel government in East Pakistan. And it indeed was a very effective uh, parallel government. The taxes were stopped to the federal government. The, the offices were closed. The banks were functioning on their orders and on their instructions. And the program included demonstrations, strike in all government offices, schools, colleges, everything. And it started in Chirong as well. We had a call from Yahya Khan's military secretary saying, you Bengalis are known to be very hospitable people. But Yahya Khan has been here for three days. And all he has been living on is biscuits because the Bengali cooks will not cook. The Bengali cooks have said they are non-cooperating with us. So will you please issue an exemption, allowing them to give him a cooked meal? So I discussed this with our leaders and said, yes, all right, we can allow him to have hot meals. The Bengali cooks were then asked in the president's house to resume their function. We maintained regular contact with the Ahmadi. And meanwhile, I started uh, mobilizing my forces. I really give them a hint of a mutiny for our own independence. Serving officers had begun to come and make contact, saying, you know, we are watching the situation and, you know, how is the city of Chittagong and the whole area keep it free for about two weeks, by which time they should be able to obtain support from foreign countries if needed. So the confrontations on, on the streets was mounting. The military on the one side against the, the roused people on the other. In Dhaka, as I say, supplies were being stopped into the cantonments. In Rongpur, there had been actual face-to-face -face confrontations between military and people. In Chittagong, where arms had, were being brought in on a ship called Swat. And at that time, you know, the political explosion had already taken place. There was movement throughout the country. And the people did not want that ship to be unloaded because we realized that arms and ammunition from that ship will be used against our own people. When they tried to unload it, 100,000 port workers just blocked two miles of the road from the ship into the city. And there were hundreds of thousands of people blocking the streets. Military were taking positions. And it was a question whether the military would really take on 100,000 people. The Pakistanis killed a large number of Bengali dock laborers and demonstrators in the port areas. And uh, I realized that this is the time to strike. On 24th night, March 24, I passed on the orders. There are two code messages on which the EPR soldiers had to act, uh, mostly the soldiers who were in the border outpost. The messages were sent and they had acted upon, in which they had neutralized all hostile forces, mainly the non-Bengali troops in EPR. And by that action, myself and my troops who had acted on it 
had sealed our own fate and our destiny for the future. So either we act to the next 24 hours for a decisive battle or we are arrested by the Pakistanis and court-martialed and probably shot.